Are you tired of hand watering your house? Today, I'm going to walk you through step by step to set up an automatic drip irrigation system to water the foundation of your house. We'll cover how to tell if it's something you should do, when you should do it, and methods you can use to ensure that all sides of the house get the appropriate amount of water. For example, a shady side probably doesn't need as much water as a side that's constantly in the sun. Foundation watering is mostly required in states with hot, dry climates. Uneven soil moisture can cause imbalances, which pushes or pulls against the foundation. The shifting soil can cause damage, things like cracks in your door frame, uneven or warped flooring. Some visual indicators you can use to determine if you need to water your foundation are things like dirt has pulled away from the foundation of the house, cracks in the dirt around your foundation and surrounding yard, cracks on the foundation's exterior. Some physical indicators you can use is dirt that feels dry to the touch, dirt that crumbles easily between your fingers, or the inability to stick a screwdriver or soil moisture meter into the soil surrounding the foundation. The most common components used to water a foundation are drip line and drip tape. These are simply emitter lines with emitters pre-installed at evenly spaced intervals. Common spacings include 6 inches, 9 inches, 12 inches, 18 inches, and 24 inches. For this system, we're going to be using one half inch main line and one half inch drip line, the same size. The reason we're doing it is because, as a general rule, you should make your half inch sizes, this include drip line and main line, less than 200 feet in total length and less than 200 gallons per hour in total flow. This means you might be using a different size. If you'd like to learn more about choosing your main line size, you can check out our article there at the top right. It covers the information in detail. While planning your foundation watering system, walk your property, see which portions of it receive more sun. Are there locations where bushes or trees block sunlight? Is there a side that's just bombarded by the sun? The sides that receive the most sun or locations that receive the most sun are gonna require the most water, while those that receive less sun or are more in the shade won't need as much water. You can customize that in multiple ways. You could do it as two different zones, so they can have two separate watering cycles. One can run more, one can run less. Or you can use different flow rate emitters like we're going to do today. How we're going to do it is the side that gets hit by the most sun is going to have one gallon per hour drip line. The side that's in the shade most of the time is going to have just a half gallon per hour drip line. That way we can keep ours all on one zone. Let's take a look at what goes into a foundation watering irrigation system. I think you'll be surprised at how few parts are actually required. Everything that we need is right here. Let's go ahead and start with our half inch main line here. This here is what's going to feed the drip line that we use. Here is the actual drip line itself. And this is the part that will be delivering the water to the foundation of the structure. The only difference between half inch main line and half inch drip line is that half inch drip line has pre-installed inline emitters at evenly spaced intervals. The drip line we're going to be using today has emitters spaced every 12 inches. And here's our timer that you can use to automate the process. A timer is not required, but does come in handy if you want it all to be done automatically. It's a hose-in timer, so it'll work with any hose bib. If you're using a hose bib, all you'll need is a hose-in timer to automate the process. It doesn't have to be this one. There's a wide variety available. Here's our gooseneck faucet adapter. Remember I mentioned how our faucet is very low to the ground? So we want this so we can kind of angle it up to fit our head assembly. Next up in our head assembly is our backflow preventer. These are very important as they keep water potentially tainted by soil bacteria, fertilizers, and things like that from flowing back into the potable water supply. Next up is our T-filter. This is also part of the head assembly. We want the T-filter again because of that low to the ground faucet. The T-shape is kind of handy for low to the ground. We call them low clearance head assemblies. And this is probably the best choice for a faucet that's close to the ground. And next up is our 25 PSI pressure regulator. 25 PSI is the optimal operating pressure for half inch drip line. And finally, the last piece of our head assembly, our hose by tubing adapter. What this does is connect your mainline tubing on this end to the rest of this head assembly here. Thus, your mainline tubing can receive water. This piece is also available as a straight adapter. Again, we want it the elbow shape because that low to the ground head assembly. If this is the last part and it's resting on the ground, it's already in the perfect spot to accept our main line tubing. Now we have one of our poly tubing elbows. We're gonna use these for 90 degree turns. So just going around corners of the house. I brought quite a few of these since we have a few corners we'll have to get around for sure. Next up is our tubing end cap. We'll use this to close off the system, put it at the end of our main line or our drip line, wherever it is and this closes the system up so that it can be pressurized. And here we've got our poly tubing coupling. This allows you to connect tubing or drip line to either side of this to join the two sections together. In addition to that, these can be used to make repairs. 
If your tubing or drip line ever becomes damaged, simply cut the damaged portion out and rejoin the two sections with the coupling. Now we have our half inch poly tubing coupling valve. This here will join two sections of tubing or two sections of drip line together or a section of tubing to drip line since they're the exact same size. These are also available without the on off. I like to use the on off version in case I want to shut off something downstream. Now we've got our poly tubing cutter. A pair of scissors can work just fine, but I like this because it has the nice little cradle to hold your tubing. It makes it a little bit easier to cut. It's not required, but I prefer to use it. But believe it or not, this is all we need. I didn't bring out every elbow, but this is every different type of fitting and tubing and drip line that we'll be using. A surprisingly few amount of supplies needed to accomplish the task. Prior to starting a job, what I like to do is open up all my fittings and group them together. Thus, I'll put the elbows with the elbows, the T's with the T's, the end caps with the end caps. That way, when I need a fitting, I know exactly where to go to get it. So this is what I was talking about by a low to the ground, low clearance head assembly. You can see the spigot here pretty close to the ground. So I brought that 45 degree gooseneck. We're going to angle it to a more horizontal approach for our head assembly. If you're not using a timer, the first part you'll put on is your backflow preventer. But since we're using a timer, it will go first. Now we're placing on our backflow preventer. Next up is our filter to protect all downstream components from debris. Now our pressure regulator, as I mentioned, to regulate all downstream pressure to 25 PSI. So I went with the 25 PSI regulator because that's what the drip line is rated for optimally. It can handle between 12 and 50 PSI and put out even watering. If we were to try to run it at 80 PSI, we could experience things like the emitters putting out way more water than they should, potentially even spraying instead of dripping. The tubing might blow off the fittings, could even cause damage to the tubing or fittings at that high. Now our hose by tubing adapter came out just about perfect. Our tubing is going to be near ground level right at the start. And we'll be able to have it facing the direction we want to go because the first side of the house is right over here. Okay, let's connect our mainline tubing here. The fitting I'm using is a permalock fitting. The reason I'm using it, in addition to the convenience of having a clamp right here in place for it, is I don't need to purchase additional clamps and the fitting is completely reusable. Things like compression fittings, they're generally a one and done. If you want to be able to reuse your fittings, Permalock make a great choice. So to connect your tubing to your fitting, all you have to do is slide the fitting on over this barb and then turn this locking nut to secure it in place. If you have any difficulty, dip the end of your tubing to a glass or pan of very hot water. So be careful what you use to store your hot water because you want it to be very hot. This will soften the tubing up enough to make it very easy to slip on over the barb. All right, let's connect it. Now I'm turning the locking nut that serves as the clamp and our tubing is secure. So we've cut enough mainline tubing to get from our head assembly over here to where the foundation starts needing watering. As you can see here, the tubing is flexible enough that it can take gentle turns without the use of an elbow. An elbow will be needed for sharper 90 degree turns as you'll see when we get down to the end of the house. But for this gentle turn here, we're just gonna let the tubing's natural flexibility take care of it for us. Here's where we're gonna install our half inch coupling. What we're gonna do is put the coupling here on our main line, and the other side of the coupling is gonna connect to our drip line. Here, where we're gonna start watering the foundation. We're gonna angle it using the tubing's natural flexibility to get about 12 to 18 inches away from the house. So now that we've got our drip line down here to the corner of the wall, I'm gonna go ahead and cut it about right here. This is where we're going to use the elbow to turn 90 degrees to get around this corner. Before I do that, I'm going to go back through and stake this to the ground. I'll show you why staking comes in handy. I'm going to stake our drip line here. And the reason I'm staking is just to hold it in place. When you pressurize the system and run water through it, it'll wiggle around. While you're installing it, it's nice to have it pinned down to the ground as well. Just makes it a little bit more manageable to work with. There are two types of stakes that are generally used with half inch mainline and half inch drip line. You got your common wire J stake and this here plastic stake with some ridges to help it grip into the ground. I prefer to use these because it's easier to hit with a hammer to get it into ground, especially true if you have like thick dense soil or clay like soil. It can be hard to get a J stake to go through and a hitting with a hammer can sometimes make it bend. But these do cost less 
and they work great in soils that are easy to push it down into. You want to lay your drip line about 12 to 18 inches from the wall here to water the foundation. If you can't get it exact, that's okay. Water spreads about 12 inches from the point of drip. So if you have landscaping in the way, I think it's okay if you're just a little bit off. Now we're here at the corner of the house, and we're going to use our elbow to turn the tubing around this corner. Now, we're going to do something a little bit different on this side of the house. This side of the house is almost always shaded, so it doesn't need watering. For that reason, we're just going to use our main line tubing, that is, no emitters are inside it, to get down this side of the house so we can get to the other side where we do want to irrigate the foundation. We're going to go ahead and use a coupling valve to connect a little bit more mainline tubing here. Those are going to be times where we want to water this side and we're not going to want to deliver any water to this side. That's where this comes in. This handy little coupling valve can be turned to shut off all downstream water. So days where we want to water the first part, but not the second part, we don't have to do any complicated zoning. We just turn our valve to off. And that is the beauty and the modularity of drip irrigation. It's so flexible, you can achieve almost any design without any complex zoning. So now we're putting on our last elbow to get around this last corner here. We have some landscaping here. So this is going to be one of those places that's not a perfect 12 to 18, but that's okay. Now we're going to connect our next roll of drip line to this side here. Instead of one gallon per hour out of each emitter, this one here does half a gallon per hour. One thing you want to keep in mind when you're installing drip line onto fittings is that there's an emitter beneath each hole. So because there's an emitter so close to where I'm connecting, I'm actually going to have to cut a little bit of this off. So to use my end cap, I'm going to cut it right after this last emitter. I'm going to give myself just enough room, because remember the emitter can block putting in the barb. So we need just enough room for that end cap there. Here's my end cap. And one handy thing about these end caps, in addition to being permalock and reusable, is that the end here can be unthreaded and removed. This makes easy to flush your system, which we're going to do here in a moment. You always want to flush your system before you run it for the first time. Now with everything installed and staked down, we're going to unthread our end cap so we can flush the system. Remember, we flush the system so that we can get any debris that got in, and some always will during installation, so we can get it and flush it right out the end cap. Then we're going to replace our end cap and run the system for the first time and give it a shot. All right, the end cap is unthreaded. Let's go to our timer and run a manual cycle. Now we've let it flush for a few moments. We're going to go turn off our manual cycle and put on our end cap and then we're going to walk the system and give it its first watering cycle. Now we're going to walk the system and make sure there's no problems with it. That consists mostly of making sure the emitters are dripping as they should in the drip line, making sure there's no leaks anywhere in the tubing or especially where the tubing connects to the fitting. So check there. If you got a leak there, just unscrew the locking nut, push it a little bit harder and then re-thread it on. That'll usually do the trick. All right, it's looking great. We got water coming from our emitters. Perfect. A perfect install. No leaks. There is one more thing I'd like to check out and to show you before we go. Follow me. So one other thing I'd wanted to show you was remember the coupling valve we installed so we could turn off anything downstream of it. So we're going to give our coupling valve a test and we're going to turn it off and make sure it shuts off our downstream drippers. Now let's go check our downstream drip line and make sure it shut off as it should with the coupling valve. Everything is working exactly as it should. Now that we've got this installed, how long and how often should we run our cycles? During summer months, foundation watering is most efficiently done either early in the morning or later in the evening to prevent evaporation. In the summer, we've seen 15 minute cycles done twice a day. During the hotter times, we've seen 30 minutes twice a day. And in the hottest, driest parts of the country, we've even seen up to 45 minutes twice a day. Each situation is unique. It's a good idea to inspect your soil conditions and adjust your watering cycles accordingly on a quarterly basis. The easiest way to tell if your foundation needs water is probably just using a soil moisture meter. It should read between 5 and 15 percent, and you'll test it anywhere between 6 and 18 inches from the wall of the house where the foundation is in the soil there. If you don't have a soil moisture meter, that's okay. You can just use a simple screwdriver. Push the screwdriver into the soil, again, about 6 to 18 inches from the foundation. If it's very difficult to push in, your foundation can probably stand to be water, particularly if it appears dry. If it's pretty easy to push in, but you pull it out and it comes out covered in mud, 
it's probably too moist and you wouldn't want to water your foundation. If your screwdriver goes in easy and comes out without mud, it's probably just about right. The final way to tell is just looking at the foundation in the house. After a few days, the soil should expand to make a good fit and push against the foundation, nice and firm. I hope this helped you install your own foundation watering system. If you found the video helpful, give us a like. If you have any questions, comment below. We're active in our channel. We'll be happy to answer any questions you have. You can also contact us at dripdepot.com. We read and reply to every email we receive, and we'd love to hear from you.